Welcome back. This is module seven, the second module in our PRISM discussion and the last one. The last one of today. One and two and the last of today. That Paul DiCarlo in the chat room, holy freaking smokes. Yeah. We're, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this very session. He's answering all the questions. It's not going to be anything left. Hopefully people are holding off to the good questions. Clearly the hard ones they're holding off on. Maybe. I mean, come on. Maybe. <laughs> Um, uh, so if you're watching, uh, stay tuned. The Q&A is here at the end. It'll be pretty exciting. So last, when last we saw our hero, he was talking about PRISM. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about the navigation service and the basic implementation. Boink. Now, we will be talking about dependency injection. No small topic. No small topic. Uh, we'll a also little bit of a brain exercise yeah. if you're not used to this. And what we aren't doing is teaching you what it is and all of its intricacies. We assume that you know that or that you're willing to invest into that learning somewhere else. Come back here and we'll show you how to implement dependency injection using PRISM. Then we also have event More specifically Agger. Unity. Well, more, it's not, uni not PRISM at all, almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really Unity. And then event aggregation, also not PRISM. <laughs> but the PubSub events also from Patterns and Practices. Then we'll talk, talk about state management, which is PRISM. There you Shazam. go. Shazam. Shazam, we're talking about PRISM after all. All right. Yeah, how about that? All right, let's begin with dependency injection. Um, again, just know dependency injection's out there and it's really awesome and there's plenty to learn about it. Once you see us implement it, you'll understand at least the gist of it. Um, Patterns and Practices built both PRISM, which we saw in our last session, and Unity, their IOC container. PRISM works great with Unity. However, developers can use any implementation that they want. It doesn't have to be Unity, but it certainly works great with Unity. If you want to use your own, I can't think of a single one right now. Ninject. Ninject, then just do it. No big deal. If you yeah. love one, don't feel like PRISM is forcing you down any path because it is not. IOC, by the way, stands for in inversion of control, if uh, you're not familiar with that term. So go away and look at both of those. They, they are pretty heavy uh, topics from an architectural perspective, but they do enable a number of uh, strategies around loose coupling um, and greatly enhances the uh, testability of your applications by virtue of allowing you to specify interfaces that get satisfied into concrete types by the configuration. That's what it does. That's exactly right. And you might think, as I can imagine, there's a developer out there saying, I probably won't be building very many unit tests for my application anytime soon, so I probably don't need this sort of pattern. It's not just a testing solution. Mm -hmm. It really does add a lot of uh, decoupling inside your application that makes it easier later, and you'll kind of see that yep. in this implementation. Uh, there's several patterns to doing uh, dependency injection. One of them is the, construct con the constructure, con <laughs> what is it? In constructor injection pattern. Yeah, yeah. My accent doesn't pronounce it properly. I think it's your teeth. Constructor injection pattern. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Take out those monkey gums. What's fantastic about it is how easy it is, right? <laughs> it's certainly the easiest approach. That's why we chose it. It's also the one that Unity does without even thinking. So that goes for it. All right, so let's talk about something that we might reuse. So in this case, this is a shared resource. This is going to be a dialogue service. So you can see it's a public dialogue service right here implemented. And we have inherited from iDialogue service, and it just has a simple interface that defines what that class does. Nothing special here, right? You would build your own services that would be nice and complicated. And if you look at Solarizer, we are loaded with services. And oh. we have a special session tomorrow dedicated just to walking through all of those different services, sometimes referred to as view services. Yeah, not to be confused with uh web services or SOAP services or whatever. Right, that's not what it all is at all. These are really just helpers for the view itself, mm -hmm. right, to help decouple it. For example, you don't want to have a reference to message dialogue anywhere, so you don't. All you have is a reference to iDialogue service, which is in the interfaces namespace, which is wherever you want it to be. All right, it works that, that easily. So this is the resource that we want to um, inject, and this is how we would inject it, right? We would declare the dependency. So in this case, this is our view model. And just like all view models, it inherits from view model and it implements a nice interface. Very simple interface. This is the same as the one we've been doing before. It's just a single property. And so we have a 
constructor up here, and it's not an empty constructor. Remember, an empty constructor is only necessary for design time data. This is runtime, and so we show that this constructor needs the interface. So we don't know which implementation of the interface is coming. We just know that one of them is. And so in this case, it's a dialog service, iDialog service. When it arrives, we save it, and we kind of just move on from there. Mm -hmm. So this is a convention-based approach that by convention we're specifying a constructor that requires a parameter, one or more, and we're leaving it up to whatever is responsible for creating an instance of this view model mm -hmm. to satisfy that. Just like any C-sharp implementation, you can see the method down here, show title. Show title is a um, um, just a way of showing how to use the service. So I can say this.dialogservice.show, and then it lets the service do everything else. Right? Just simple little implementation. All right. Um, maybe I could just show you the whole thing. Why not? All right. Dive straight in. Let's dive straight in. All right. So the first thing we'll do is um, I'll show you exactly what we just did. I'll create a simple dialog service, and I'll make sure that it's based off of the interface. And again, you could create services that do absolutely anything. We have them that uh, inter interact with the secondary tile. We have them that interact with. So we're basically starting from the project that we had beforehand, um, fleshed out, and now we're adding in this dependency. Right. So the interfaces namespace will have two interfaces. We already have the one for I main page view model, and here we are at uh, I dialog service. Now look, it's a simple implementation that uh, we're going to do the. Uh, you know, the message dialog is kind of a tricky class, to be honest, because it's always, um, there's two things that are weird about it. One, it's asynchronous whenever you want to show it. And the second thing, you can't accidentally show two, because yeah. we've certainly seen that on Windows applications where you get them stacked on top of each other. That can't happen with the, uh, the a regular message dialog. So here it is. Here's the concrete class. You can see that it is implementing interfaces.idialogservice. And we created a brand new namespace for it, services. And so uh, here's the show, and uh, the quick implementation is basically to uh, create a brand new dialog that is, hang on a second, not create a new message dialog. I'll create a brand new dialog that's a new message dialog. It's uh, windows.ui.popups. Again, one of the reasons we would do this is so we don't have to have windows.ui.popups in the same, let's say, portable class libraries mm -hmm. where our view models are. Right? So let me just start, let me get it all right. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> just focus. <laughs> all right. So we just pass in content. Nothing special. Uh, nothing special at all. And so there's the await, and so it kind of handles it from there. If I were building a real uh, message dialogue service, by the way, I would keep track of whether or not one is visible you know, mm -hmm. to make sure that I don't do it twice. Yeah, and so, if you're doing unit testing, it would just do nothing because you wouldn't want a dialogue to come up in the unit test. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'd want to sniff it, and maybe I would actually have a concrete implementation just for unit tests to mm -hmm. make sure it doesn't accidentally do that. Yeah, that's right. Now, remember, the way that we get these dependencies into our view models is simply to reference them, interfaces, whoop, interfaces, there we go, um, dot dialog surface, is simply to reference them as a constructor, as a parameter in the constructor. Mm -hmm. Is it a parameter or an argument? Oh, we could go round and round on that one, isn't it? I always forget, to be honest. All right, so I'll make a, uh, a field that we'll store it in called underscore dialog service, and then I'll make sure it's set up inside the interface. And so this is very similar to the code we looked at in the slide. All right, so here's my um, override of on navigated to. So this is where I'll actually use it. In this case, we set title to hello runtime just for fun, and uh, I'll immediately read that title. Using the dialog service, I'll show it. Now, nothing is going to inject that for us yet. So the reason it's not is because we don't have an, in, in, an IOC container, mm -hmm. an, I, an inversion of control container. Yep. So remember, we're going to use Unity. So I'll go into the NuGet package here and just search for Unity. It's the first one that pops up right here. Again, by Microsoft, by the Patterns and Practices team. People, by the, I mean, developers use this all the time. Unity is mm -hmm. a well-established uh, container. And so now I've uh, added it to our project, but now I need to start implementing it on inside our uh, app.xaml. So this is, uh, remember, this is everything that was replaced by MVVM app base, so it's simplified. I'll create a quick um, uh, field. We'll make it a read-only so nobody accidentally overwrites our container. I'll make it a Unity container, and from that point forward, everything will be uh, 
everything will be inside that container. We'll have to first tell that container things like um, where to find the iDialog. Uh, so let's start with that. So I'm going to override on initialize sync. On, we need this to be happen before anything else. Yeah, that's exactly right. On initialize is really great because it happens so early and it's completely reliable, right? It, and so uh, uh, I, you wouldn't make on initialize too heavy, I don't think. That just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. So if you had a whole bunch of really difficult things you needed to do it when the application launches, you would use on launch instead. So I'll make a reference to my interface here, and I'll basically say container dot register type. And so there's two things I pass into this generic uh, interface here. And the first one is the is uh, the interface. Uh, is the interface. The inter yes. Pass the interface into the interface. I didn't mean to say it quite yep. like that. Anyway, it takes two uh, pieces there. The first one is the interface itself. The second is the concrete class that I want to use for that. So basically, every time somebody asks for iDialog service, they get dialog service. And of course, if I had two or three different implementations of dialog service, I could switch between them with an if statement or something like that and update the container. Yeah. You also specified a, con a lifetime manager there. And that really controls how uh, Unity, whether it instantiates the object immediately, how long that object stays around, whether it's just a single singleton and so on. Yeah, if you had to pick whether or not it's a singleton. I'm going to override resolve here. Resolve is basically where you get to implement your own container. So in this case, I'm going to make sure it's using the Unity's container. But if you had another one, all you have to do is put your own code into resolve. Resolve basically says, give me the type and I'll pass you yeah. the interface. And that's the composability of Prism. And that's the composability of Prism. Yep, that's exactly right. I put a couple namespaces so we can see it, or I mean a couple breakpoints. So I stop first on initialize. Remember that happens first, and I'm going to set up and register my type. So let me go on through here. Beautiful. Now I'll continue and, and I'll go to launch. Remember, it doesn't need to have that dialog service yet because it hasn't navigated to my view model. So nothing has happened yet, and so I'll continue. The first thing that happens is a resolve now because now my view model needs to be instantiated. In order to do that, it sees the type, iDialog service, it's going to return dialog service. Here I am in the constructor of my view model, and it's actually there. Unity did all the work for me, creating the concrete class, and now I can use it in on navigated to. If we go ahead and run it, you can see there's my pop-up, hello runtime, reading from the same thing as the title. It's quick and easy, but to be honest, it's as complicated as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is how we do it in Solarizer almost exactly. Um, it may look like I oversimplified the implementation, but that's it. I mean, if you added up all the lines, there might be 15. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, much of the work is all rolled up into the Unity NuGet package doing it for us, but exactly. it makes it so that developers... Well, that's the whole point. Yeah, that's the whole point, abstracting and encapsulating it away. Dependency injection allows you to create decoupled building blocks of code. So I can create all the services I want to, register those types inside the initialize, and then just start using them. Any view model needs it, they just start adding it and they get it. And the reality of what inversion of control really means is that in a traditional approach to building your main page view model, you would create an instance of dialogue service within that view model. What we're saying is, the main page view model now no longer controls the lifetime and, in fact, the resolution between concrete type and uh, interface mm -hmm. of its dependence. That although the main page view model is dependent upon an implementation of iDialog service, it allows another co uh, element yep. to actually instantiate that and pass it in. That's the inversion of control that IOC is talking about. Not only does it allow it, but it re relies on it now. Mm -hmm. and that, it's, it's no longer acting as a factory to create those services. Yep. Something outside is going to do it, please, because I don't know how. It just receives it and starts using it, assuming everything is working fine. Where this becomes golden is when you may be dependent on 15 services. Yeah. And uh, then what you're saying is main page view model needs to know intimately how each of those uh, dependent services are instantiated. And also say one of those services has dependencies on other services. Now all of a sudden you've got this cascading effect of main page view model needs to know everything and it's wired into everything. And it becomes very complicated once you start building that tight coupling to maintain code down the line. It's totally true. 
Barry, cut over to my screen for a second. Let me show the constructor of the appointment page view model inside of Solarizer. So we collapse it inside a region because the, you really don't interact with the constructor at all, and it starts getting pretty long because of dependency injection. This view model uses a lot of dependencies. So I can expand it, and you can see here are all the fields that hold them. Here is the uh, request, basically, inside the constructor. And this is me just uh, switching them so that they're up in the field so we can use later. So the, whole, the holding, here's the request as far as parameters, and then transferring them over to the field. And at no point do we, in, a, in the application, create a new instance of the main page view model. It's all handled for us by the infrastructure. That's right. Imagine how complicated it would be to try and create this now with this long and complex of a constructor. It'd be mm -hmm. just an absolute mess. Unity doesn't think twice about it. This is what it does for a living, Yep. so to speak. All right. Great. Boom, now let's talk about messaging. So messaging is um, a way for views, for view models, or any other code to communicate inside your app without having to have a reference to whoever it is they're communicating to. Yeah. It's basically my ability to pass you something, but there's a third party involved. I pass it to them. They pass it to you. Yeah. That's kind of how it all works. We all have. It's almost like having escrow. It's like having escrow. That's right. And sometimes this is referred to as an, as an event aggregator. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the case of patterns and practices implementation, it's the PubSub events model. Yeah, and it actually builds off of the enterprise pattern for publish subscribe. Yeah. And uh, this, just like Unity, has been used everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so this is very well established. And so it's, it's great that it can roll into uh, the Prism and VVM framework that we're going to use for store apps. And it's just worth saying again, if this is not what you want to use, you can easily plug in another one. This just solves the problem um, kind of with a Microsoft solution. All right, so Patterns and Practices created it. It's called Pub Sub Events, and it addresses that common problem of tightly coupling .NET events. Tightly coupled .NET events causes serious problems. Yes, and um, fundamentally it's based around memory leaks and holding on to references from objects from other objects means it never drops out of scope and isn't garbage collected. Mm -hmm. If you want to know more about that, then we did talk about that a great deal in our Fundamentals of C Sharp. Yeah, a great deal. Uh, if I were to summarize it with an example, I would take Barry. <laughs> there he is. And uh, so, Is that uh, garbage that needs to be collected? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> I need to collect some garbage. Oh, it's harsh. Uh, but uh, Barry has, you know, let's say, tied a string to you, and he's tied a string, and that's, that's unfortunate. That is the kind of event registration. And uh, until he cuts that string, I can't collect him, right? I can't take him out of the building. And the reason is that string, like an event uh, handler, it's to keep alive. It keeps it alive. That's exactly right. And garbage collection simply doesn't work. That's, yep. that's the way it is. Two objects do the same thing. You have to remember to do the minus equals. I mean, mm -hmm. if we were really just looking at the syntax. Absolutely. So uh, uh, one of the two of the core tenets of this pub sub event model is that the subscriber, so in this case you and me, the subscriber has no idea who the publisher is. Equally, the publisher has no idea who the subscriber or subscribers are, right? Yeah. We don't, we don't you know. You could be firing out and nobody could be listening. Hmm. Right. You're a dork. <laughs> Pub sub events provides developers with strongly typed messages as well. So when you do actually receive, let's say, a little character, you know that it's Scotty and not Bones, right? Because yep. it's strongly typed when you receive it. As well as it has a payload, right? So not only do you have the type, but it also has data on you the You mean it actually site. has a message? It actually has a message. Ah, Isn't that neat? That's so much. Yeah, it's messaging. So uh, I can send that out. One person can receive it. Not person, but one uh, subscriber can receive it. But so can all of them, right? So an mm -hmm. example is log out. I need everything to lock down because the user just logged out. That'd be a simple message you'd broadcast out to your entire application. Can I show it to you? Why not? All right. Rude not to. Let me do it inside Visual Studio here. Uh, the first thing is we're going to make a reference to pub sub events. Now, we're going to do it with the actual um, command line of Nougat instead of the UI of Nougat. The UI of Nougat doesn't allow you to pick specific versions. And um, for whatever reason, the current version is a little, it just isn't, isn't working. And so we'll take 1.1.0 instead of the current version of 1.1.1. And so now you can see we've successfully, uh, we've successfully added it to our project. And um, 
I'm, I'm already, I've already talked to the team about it, so I'm not worried about this, but uh, just something squirrely, I'm sure. Squirrel, mm -hmm. Some monkey business going on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we've made our reference to PubSub events, and we're ready to go. And um, by the way, that change just happened because we built Solarizer on 1.1.0. So mm -hmm. 1.1.1 yep. just came out of nowhere. All right. And some people are talking about 2.0.0 that's sit sitting out there. Yeah, they are wrong. <laughs> they, they, they are wrong. All right. How about a new namespace for us? This one's going to be where we define our messages. And uh, so the, the, really, we only need one message. I'll demonstrate this uh, logout concept. And so uh, we'll make it public, and we'll make sure that it inherits from pub sub event. And pub sub event is a generic type that is not, 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 not pub sub. There we go. Yeah, pub sub event. And so this is the payload. That payload could be event arguments. That payload could be a full object. It could be anything that we need. And remember, it just ha it's transactional, so it occurs and it's over. It's not held in memory. And so in this case, it's just going to be a string. And so now it's a matter of referencing the instance inside the view model. So let me show you what's going on here. Um, this is the initializer, so on initialize. And I'm going to need the, so wait a minute, this is the initializer of app.xamlcs where yeah. I allow it to be a dependency that I can inject. Yeah, so you're basically creating your uh, single event source. That's right. That your event broker that's going to move these pub subs around. I don't have to uh, do much special. I event aggregator and the event aggregator are all here now in scope. I just create them. And look how I'm doing a register instance mm -hmm. instead of a register type. I don't need for Unity to go create the event aggregator. I only want one of them. And so I register the instance of the one I create. And from that point forward, anybody who uses it in any of the, or any, let's say, view model who uses it as a dependency that's injected into it um, gets the same one. Yeah. And uh, I get to use it right away, too. So that's, yeah, that's the Yeah, there are scenarios where you might create multiple channels for messages mm -hmm. if you've got specific components that just want to listen to certain types of messages and so on. But this is just a general broadcast. Yeah. That would likely be an edge case, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. More typical in the older, more complex prism. So I'm just going to add it to the constructor. And so once I add it to the constructor, Unity already knows what to do. So I'll make sure that there's a field that I store it in, and then I will uh, make sure I store it into that field. So here we go. That sounds useful. Aggregator, right. Now I'm pretty much done. This is really why I wrap our constructor with a region, just because you don't need to look at all that, and it makes it look complicated when if you just sit and look at it, it's not complicated really at all. Anyway, so I'll use the on navigated 2 to set up the, um, the subscription to any message that's sent. And when you set up a subscription, it's not to any message, it's to a specific message. So uh, let's go ahead and reference underscore event aggregator. And from there, we get the event that we want to, or no, no, we get the message that we want to listen for. Yep. So in this, it's the get event uh, method for sure, but we specify the specific message we're listening for. So there could be hundreds of possible messages. This way we don't have to, we certainly don't want to register all of them. When you subscribe, you give it the delegate that you want to execute whenever it's run. So in this case, I'll just call it handle logout and let the refactoring tools inside Visual Studio go ahead and create the method for us. You can see it's type string, the argument coming in. That's because I created um, that message type of just string. Again, if it had been event args or something like that, this, that's the type that we'd have here as well. So look, I'm just going to use the dialog service. I'm just kind of changing a little bit. Um, I'm going to use the dialog service just like I did before, and it's going to show whatever is sent when the message is posted. So, or published, that's the word I want to use. So where are we going to publish it? Let's go ahead and let all the navigation occur, and then let's um, publish it right away. So this isn't how you do it. You'd probably publish it as a result of a logout action or a timer re that's checking to see if the token is still valid. But uh, in this case, container.resolve is just my way of quickly getting the event aggregator, that, and Unity is giving it right back to me. And then I can get the event. Remember, this is similar to how we subscribe to it. But in this, place, in this case, I'm going to publish and then pass in my string payload of you need to log in. Remember, I use the dialog service just to show that payload that comes across. So I'll go ahead and let Unity resolve it, and then I'll find it, or I'll get that specific logout message, and I'll publish it. Anybody who's subscribed to it re will receive it in multiple cases, right? It, any number of subscriptions, they'll all get it at once. It's transactional, it goes away, 
doesn't stay in memory. So whatever that payload is, I don't have to worry about that building up or causing some sort of problem. Well, there we are. You need to log in with the message that I sent. That's the message payload. Remember, it received it on the uh, view model, and then I used the dialog service to show it. There we go. I've communicated from app.cs up to anybody who's listening. In this case, it's the main page view model. Pretty cool. Awesome. Good yeah. job. Messaging done. I mean, this happens a lot. You know, how do you tell one thing this? What do you, how do you tell one thing that? Just use messaging. It's great. All right. Messaging allows you to decouple classes so they don't communicate directly. That's the whole issue of the string between you and Barry in the first place. Yep. <laughs> Snip. Consider Snip. it cut. Yeah, cut the cord, Barry. All right. Let's talk about state management. This is one of the other um, really valuable features that we get. This one comes specifically from Prism. So the other two we were talking about, Unity, of course, comes from patterns and practices still, yep. but it's not part of that, that MVVM framework at all. And um, then we also have uh, uh, PubSub events. Um, both of which well established in the community and uh, just things that roll in and you can you can use your own if you don't necessarily want that or you're more custom to another one. State management on the other hand is something specific for store apps written inside the Prism framework for uh, store apps and let's see how you implement it. Something to remember about the Windows runtime is that if your app doesn't have any visible pixels then it can go into a suspended state. Right, 99% of the time it goes into, there are a few edge cases where some things happen, but um, it goes into a suspended state where you'd have no, no longer do you have any of your threads scheduled on the processor and so there's no activity whatsoever. As soon as that happens, um, you don't have the option to save data, you don't have the option to do anything because you're completely suspended. And then if memory starts to run low, you can also be terminated. But what happens when the user comes back? What happens when the user comes back and they've been halfway filling out the form on your, on your application? The expectation from the user is they want to be halfway filling out the form and not lose what's there. Certainly in a reasonable time scale. Certainly in a reasonable time scale. In fact, if you read MSDN about suspension, uh, the resuming from suspend, it says if a certain amount of time has passed, then you go ahead and clear the cache. And how long is that time? That is variable. Yeah, it's up to you. It's what makes sense. If um, somebody is uh, filling out some f detailed form and they come back to it in nine months, are they really going to remember where they got to in that form? Yeah. Probably not. You're probably going to want to reset them back to the beginning of the experience. If they're filling out a list of, um, of New Year's resolutions and they come back the next year, <laughs> Well, just, then you could argue that, yes, maybe you should show it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. All right. So the real key here is the idea of terminated. So as soon as the resuming, ev or the, the suspended suspending event is raised, um, you want to quickly act to save everything wherever it is. It's a real pain. It's a real mess to have to deal with that. What's great is Prism handles it for us, does it all in a line or two. We don't even have to think about it. It actually just does it with decoration. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have to change any of our code. The other thing about it is it deals with it as it goes. It deals with it as it goes. What do you mean by that? Well, as you navigate um, from main into, say, appointment detail into some tertiary oh, location, yeah. it's actually saving state as it moves out from each of those elements on the navigated from so that if a suspension occurs whilst you're at the bottom of that navigation tree, it doesn't have to suddenly call all the way back and say, eh, we've only got a few seconds, everybody save your state. They've already saved their state as you progress from each of those particular views so that you only have to capture that instance state, as it were, on the suspension. I'm glad you talked about the depth of navigation because that's another piece that this solves as well, is I come in I, and I'm working inside your app. I'm two, three levels deep working on a form. I go out, I come back in. Great, the form's been repopulated, but where am I in the navigation stack? Mm -hmm. I really want to start way over here, not have to navigate back from the main exactly. page. Exactly, and when you hit back on that nested form, you want to go back to where you were. That's right. So, as a result, you have all of this taken care of in state management inside Prism and View and Framework. It's all auto magic. It's all auto magic, and it, it handles 90% of all the cases. That's mm -hmm. what's great, which is probably most of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's only missing about 10%. It's funny, that. Can I, can I show you a demo of it? I think you should. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to need to create a new page here. Um, this will be the login page so that we can kind of do it from there. And um, th because I need another page that I can start typing in so we can see the data getting saved in our form fields. So in this case, I'll just continue on with the app that we had before. And it'll be, um, it'll be a, the login page. So I'll have, I'll have a username and I'll also create a, a password. And of course, inside an interface, there's no need for, for public because that's implied, right? Whenever you mm -hmm. actually inherit it. Anyway, so uh, now that I've got the interface done, what I need next is the view model, and then we'll create the view here in just a second. Again, because everything is nicely decoupled, I can, I can create things in any order that I want to. And uh, anyway, so here's the uh, uh, log in page view model. Two things. The first one is the inheritance of view model, also the implementation of I log in page. So that's nice. <laughs> the um, and that little those those are because I don't have a, a using statement. Yep. And, and let's fix that. Now I do. Of course, I could delete it below. Never. Let's never do that. Yeah. Never mind. All right. Um, I'm going to implement these by hand instead of letting Visual Studio do it for me because I want to make sure that I use my little prop notes uh, uh, snippet here so that I can make sure these are I notify property change. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I can basically use the uh, bindable base that I get from the view model inheritance. Yep. Yeah. So now inside design time, so this is me creating the view model that I'll use when I'm designing the page. All I need to do is implement the interface and really nothing special about that either. So because of that, I can use just the standard props syntax. Here's username and then I'll also add, uh, uh, also, name, uh, also add password. Of course, they don't need to have bindable base. They wouldn't have it anyway because I'm not going to be making real-time changes in the designer. But inside this constructor, I'll go ahead and put in that design time data that I want to see. I'll just put uh, design user, and then I'll put design pass as well. And there's huge value there in setting the password because you can make sure you've set the right type of field when you're displaying the password. Because what you don't want to do is show it clear text. So this really helps in the design experience. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, certainly you're going to run your application before you finally deploy it, and so you'd see it too, but why have to mess with that when you can get here as well? A yeah, rich design time experience is fully supported by the tooling. Not to enable that for yourself is just shameful, absolutely shameful. It's a missed opportunity for sure. It's a missed opportunity. That's exactly right. So here we are back in App XAML, and so I'm going to need to create another instance. Uh, and this, type, um, this time I'm going to have to create a, uh, a reference to the navigation service. Mm -hmm. That's because I need to navigate to log in, right? So I want to be able to enable that. So here we are, this dot navigation service, remember it's already part of the base, that MVVM app base. And so now I can start um, injecting that into my view model. And so uh, remember we like uh, strongly typed experiences rather than literal strings, so I added login to it. So we haven't actually created the login page yet, but uh, I'll do that. I'll do that right now, right? Here's the, uh, the experience. Again, those experiences are kind of up to you and where it actually ends up. Uh, and the uh, views namespace where I put all of the, uh, the XAML really is the wrong place for um, me to add the, is really the wrong place for me to add the login itself. So I'll need to create the actual page. I'll put it up in a views folder. But before we do that, we have to be able to get to login. So uh, again, I'll just expand the uh, constructor of main page view model so that it includes the navigation service. Easy enough. I'll make sure that it has a uh, field for me to put it in as well as uh, the logic for me to put it into that field. Now the view model is, uh, the main page view model is ready. I need to go ahead and uh, navigate to login. The right time to log in well, frankly, the right time to log in is whenever they log out. So I'll go ahead and uh, leave that message.logout that we're using, we've subscribed to. We'll handle logout. The first thing I'll do is show the message you have to log in. And then what's the next thing is to navigate them to the login page so they have to log in. And this is sort of a, sort of a natural couple steps that we'll do. It'll be fun uh, tomorrow when we talk about security. We'll do this in a, another real world step where it's not, the goal is not to show um, state management, but the goal is to show really what do you do with login now? Yeah, how do you use tokens and everything along those lines? Yeah. Well, might as well do this right and create a views folder to put my login page in. 
Of course, I've already moved the main page, but uh, that's all right for now. I'll create just a blank because I don't mind typing XAML. Uh, hopefully, everybody knows how to, uh, to code in XAML already. If you don't know how to code in XAML, there are a few courses on MVA to do it. Yeah, of yeah. which we both have some. Yeah, we both have seen it. That's exactly <laughs> right. All right, so there's going to be a couple steps here. There's no getting around it to implement the entire thing because of the full implementation of PRISM is what gives you the full and rich capability around state management. So we'll start by making sure that uh, our class implements the base class that we've built in this project already. We'll make sure that uh, it inherits from iView. We'll do everything we want to, or everything we need to, including um, right here, I'll make sure that we wire up the uh, view model also. I want to be very comprehensive here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, the, the flip side of it is, is although there's a number of steps, I mean, it takes a couple, just a couple of minutes, and you're there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's trade-offs. I mean, for the amount of value you're going to get out of this, it's worthwhile this little bit of investment in just the infrastructure. And no doubt about it, I can tell you that if I were running or, or working on a project where this is the uh, approach we wanted to use, I would absolutely... Um, build out templates for this, right? Exactly. So I would say, I would right click a folder instead of file new item blank page, I would file new item project page or you know, MVVM page or whatever it is mm -hmm. that we wanted to call it. It would be set up for this project properly. So that would help me save time, but it would also help me communicate to my developers the architecture of the project to make sure they did it right as well. Because okay. yeah. this is a little bit repetitive, there's no getting around it, it's just, it's just a hair. Yeah, and whilst we're going through this, uh, let's just remind everybody if you've uh, got some questions you've been holding back, why don't you start putting them into the chat channel now so that they're ready once we get to the end. That's right. You might even precede them somehow with a little prefix, something like a <laughs> Q colon or something so that we know it's not just a comment, but it's actually a question. We've got Chris over there kind of vetting everybody. Nobody can put dumb questions. Chris will delete them immediately. Any dumb question? There's only, there are no such thing as dumb questions. And Barry's just been deleted. Only dumb answers. Oh. This is such, this is a very, very simplistic, um, very simplistic UI that we have. All I'm gonna do is type in username and password. Remember, if you're gonna have a text box, mode needs to be set to two ways, so not, you don't just read the uh, value, but you also write the value. Update source trigger is also an important aspect here. That means that you don't have to tab out of the control in order for it to write. It uh, writes back into your control every time you make a change to the value of it. There's a little button there. We won't actually use the button. All I want to see is that I've bound this correctly, so you can see the design user, and you can just see design pass. Both of those are what we set up in the design time view model. So at least everything is, uh, all the binding is set up properly. Perfect. Uh, the last thing, then, is to simply decorate with restorable state. Restorable state is the magic. Restorable state is where we go in. I'm going to go to my navigation service. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to go to the login view model. And I have two properties, username and password. Both of those get decorated with restorable state. So restorable state is inside the, uh, inside the prism namespace. So I'll put both of them. Right? You can see it's uh, practices prism.mvvm.restorable state attribute. All that's really saying is, if I'm about to suspend my application, then this is an active view model, put all of that into the session state bag. And when it comes out, take them out of the session state bag and put it back in. So I got immediately navigated to the second page, and I'm going to start typing in, let's say, my name. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good start. Yeah, and I'll stop it. Right? So this, this is not a suspension. This is just a stop. It's worse than that. It's dead, Jim. It's dead, Jim. I don't have that one. A doctor, not a physicist. Right? And so you can see it's totally blank. Nothing is there. That's because the, it, this only works for when it's suspend and resume. Yeah. If you so kill here it, it's going to be done. This time I'm going to suspend. And I, the way I do that is with the lifecycle events. If you uh, go into Visual Studio and you add the debug location toolbar, that will allow us to... Um, uh, that'll allow you to fake a resume. So in this case, uh, not only did I suspend, I suspended and terminated, right? So it's completely gone. The app's not running whatsoever. And now when I run it again, it'll actually cause it to resume from termination. And so when that occurs, 
beautiful. Look, it's pre-populated. Not only that, it navigated me without the pop-up that said, you have to log in. That's because it never went to main page. It went straight it into the secondary Basically page. restored your uh, navigation stack. It basically restored my navigation stack as well as the data that's inside the view model when it was when it was suspended. That's exactly right. It's really a beautiful implementation. Could I have done all of this manually and coded it myself? In this few minutes? No way. Probably not. But, uh, but I could have. It'd just be a lot of extra boilerplate code. The way that you do it in your project would probably look really similar to the way that I do it in my project. Why when? do we write this over and over again? Now you don't have to. It's implemented yeah. in Prism for Storage. That's apps. why we have boilerplate. Boilerplate clo close <laughs> code. It's ridiculous. All right. So, no getting around it. Prism provides a very simplified framework for managing state. So uh, we saw that it also gives us navigation. We saw that it also allows us to use dependency injection and use Unity. It also, we have messaging now at our disposal and all those things are pluggable and you can switch them in and out, but it's pretty great. What did we look at? Dependency injection, event management, and state, man event aggregation and state management. All of which, you, ne you need to learn it to know what you're doing, right? It's mm -hmm. not just a fall into place sort of code, but at the same time, it's not all that complicated. If you really look at the number of lines in order to do it, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. 20, 25 lines maybe to do state management, 15 lines maybe to do event aggregation. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right. That's the end of today. It's the end also of this particular module. We have some time left over. And a couple things we want to say. First, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, we think it's really valuable, not just to see how things are done, but kind of why things are done the way they do, and get some guidance for you to go down a certain path, unless you have a reason to go otherwise. That's what we've really been hoping to be able to communicate today. We're also, we like to see the questions that you're asking, because that allows us to understand areas where perhaps there hasn't been good guidance, and that allows us to tailor what we're doing, not only within this course, but also other courses that we're thinking about delivering and putting together. So you know, we really welcome those questions, and we'd also love to get your feedback um, in terms of how valuable this uh, session today and the session tomorrow will be, and so we'd love it if you really went uh, and took the time to complete the poll as well. Yep. Um, we have a handful of questions. Um, remember, the poll at the end is Ultra important, ultra important. Um, all right, let's look at the questions. I've got a couple of them. Remember, please proceed them with Q colon so that I can find them quickly. The chat, uh, chat room's pretty busy and uh, we wanna make sure we do it. Uh, one of them that we have here, this is from Mike D 1215 Says, why is there no key added to the design time data context? So I, I imagine what he's picturing is, the, um, like what we do with resources. Ah, things. yes, having a resource dictionary and so on and so forth. Well, we use keys so that we can reference them elsewhere yep. as a static resource, but we're not setting up a resource really at all. All we're saying is we're setting the, the value of a property is all we're doing. Which property is it? It's data context. Yep. And with the D colon just says don't do this when it's runtime. So what's inside there, it's the rich syntax for setting the value of a, um, of a property. And it's basically just instantiating that class and setting the property to its return value. We couldn't reuse that somewhere else, at least by, st by static name reference. It's immediately set inside that property. Why is there no key? Because it's not a resource. Yeah, and you're not accessing a dictionary. I mean, one of the things that um, often gets lost sometimes when you're looking at XAML is XAML is fundamentally a static language for instantiating objects. That's effectively what it does, that each of the elements represents an object that's being created and instantiated behind the scenes. Each of the attributes matches to properties or dependency properties. And again, if you're not clear on the difference between a property and a dependency property, yeah. then we've covered those in detail in previous courses. It's, it's a very powerful concept once you've got your head around it, the same way as attached properties are and so on. Uh, here, uh, Melvin Dev says that a book, Programming XAML from Jerry and Darren would be great. I think that's just a general comment. <laughs> <laughs> Could be great, right? <laughs> uh, what are common examples of using messaging, right? We talked about log in, log out as examples, but that's not the only one. So you could imagine you've got some asynchronous service that's sitting in the background doing, a, say, a timed poll. 
is going out to pull down new articles. Mm -hmm. And so that is a headless service, i.e. it's not attached to any specific view, it's just instantiated during the application startup. It's checking, checking, there's no new messages. Oh, I have a new message. So now I wish to alert the active view that new messages are available, the message is received, the view then initializes a process whereby it goes out and reaches out and pulls in those new messages and updates the display. Mm -hmm. So that way is a nice loose coupling between the view doesn't have to worry about how it's gonna get the messages or checking. You have a background service that's doing that. What's great about that is you could have a common control on every view in your application that happens to show whether there's a new message that has arrived. And so that can be updated, say, hey, three new messages there. Then you can actually go and navigate and view your messages in detail. That's one example. Another one might be um, the data that you have that you're showing the user includes an interstitial advertisement. So you have data, 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 add, data, data, data. Jerry's all about up, the monetization. That shows up in the grid, right? And so the user then they click on uh, buying an in-app purchase, and they click, they buy the in-app purchase. When it's finished, that raises or or publishes an event that says. Everything's done, right? You, it, this is the pro version, so to speak. Yep. And uh, you can have make sure that your view model is listening for that, and as soon as it happens, extracts all of the advertisements from the... Collapses them, for example. Collapses them or, or, or removes them, either one. That's exactly yep. right. Yeah, those are a couple of ideas. There's many more. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, Stephen PSA said, uh, is there a dependency between Prism and Unity? I do not believe so because the, the, uh, the namespace would um, be available to us uh, when you install the package and we have to separately install Unity as part of the uh, package right. installation. Um, whether there is an internal version of that, I couldn't say. I haven't actually looked in the source yeah. code itself to see if they've scoped a v an implementation of Unity within the package that they've made private so that you're still free to use your own versions of Unity. Of, uh, I doubt injection. it, because the way Resolve works inside the app base, mm -hmm. I can't imagine they would do it that way. Um, and that said, it, they still have to go out and find the view model. Yeah? Oh, yeah, but I've seen that code. Okay. I mean, th th no, I mean, that's like inside the Prism code, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, which is pretty cool. If you have a question like that and you're like, hey, I wonder if, don't forget, all the source code is on CodePlex. You can dissect it all that you want. And, uh, but, from a practical sense, you can have, you can use Unity in your application and you never use Prism. You can use Prism in your application and you never use Unity. Or you can use both, right? So that's how they're decoupled and they certainly don't have a dependency that way. Um, you also said, or can you use either standalone? Just answered that one. You got a very satisfied vote from me, said Stephen. You got a thumbs up from me, said Jerry. All right, <laughs> excellent. Nice, all right. Uh, Daytona Rob said, uh, how can you code and talk at the same time? Very impressive. Well, um, it's what we do for a living. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, exactly. Uh, it's, uh, it's Jerry's mouth is on autopilot. So. <laughs> I can talk and do anything at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let us see. Let's see. XAML is difficult to learn, even though it has been around since such a long t since such a long time. Which element can be used inside which element, so on and so forth. If you were trying to learn XAML for the very first time, where might you go to learn some of it? I would go to MVA and the Jump Starts because they're doing a good job in terms of bringing relevant content um, based around the technologies that are available today. Yep. If you're going out and hitting the internet and searching for XAML, you're gonna get a confusion of responses because there are, have been so many versions of XAML throughout the lifetime of WPF, Silverlight, first iterations of Windows yep, Store and right. so on and so forth. So yes, I mean, you do have our sympathy. It, it is often very difficult to go and find these answers. There is a uniformity to the entire framework, however. You know, I mean, if there is a commonality, if for you sure. know what a grid is, no matter where you are, a grid works fine. If you know what a stack panel does, if you know the base panel or an items control, those are the same everywhere. So there is something to um, XAML is XAML is XAML. I do think, though, that they, you know, he's certainly got a valid point in terms of, you know, when do you use a data template? Uh, where does the data template appear? You've got it nested inside an item template and so on and so forth. That there are a number of conventions that XAML does seem to be very verbose, and that's necessary for scoping 
um, the child elements and so on, you know, because as Jerry's mentioned a number of times, XAML is XML. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to follow certain rules that are available to us. Because it's an object instantiation language, certain things have to be contained within certain elements. Sometimes they do some cheats, which make it seem much simpler than it actually is. Yep. Some of the default converters and so on and so forth that exist hide some of that complexity. But in other cases, it's not easy to actually do those workarounds. So yeah, you do have our sympathies. Um, MVA is a good starting point, without a doubt, because yep. uh, it's the most modern, it's the most engaged right now. There are other great places. There's certainly quick hit answers that you mm -hmm. can find like on Stack Overflow. There yep. are videos on Pluralsight. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, pa Paul pulled up this awesome article that says, ready to learn XAML? And then it links to all of our stuff. It's awesome. Ooh. I wrote it. <laughs> I didn't even remember. i would tell you the truth. That's actually, all right. All right, here's a Steph, let's see. Uh, Sebi L says, asks, What's, what's the skill level for tomorrow? Does it continue like it ended, or will it be like it started today? What's the answer to make sure you'll watch it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're gonna continue where we are, right? This is, a, everything builds on where we are right now. We've just covered all the basic pieces, and to be honest, we're gonna go quite a bit deeper inside Solarizer tomorrow we to see the actual implementation, the bits of code that we hope you'll be able to use inside your applications too. Yeah, we'll also be talking in depth around um, Active Directory authentication, mm -hmm. showing how to incorporate that, not only in terms of revisiting the login scenario that Jerry's sort of outlined right now, but also how we can leverage that to call services that are protected through authentication. That's right, we'll talk about notifications and things like that as well. There's a lot we'll be talking about, but I'd say from a technical point of view, we're at the level now. Yep. So if this feels uh, comfortable to you, then we're here, right? We're not gonna go super uh, deep. I would say we're already at a 200 plus level already. Mm -hmm. yep. And the other thing is, you know, if you've got questions, then by all means ask them. The, uh, the team that's uh, out there answering the questions right now are doing an awesome job in keeping ahead of the curve in terms of the questions you're asking. And also if you ask questions early during the day, uh, the team inside the room here are feeding those, us those questions during the intermission. And if necessary, we can address them during uh, follow-up modules. You know, we're not. Let's cross not our fingers rounds. that Paul's here tomorrow. Every yeah. question I'm trying to answer, he goes ahead and answers right yeah. in line. Pretty hilarious. Um, let me say this. Um, th this is a great question. This is from Steph three, and uh, saying or asking, uh, how is restoration of pages working in Prism, uh, insofar as the navigation payload? And so this is great because when you restore, no, 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 when you re when you suspend, yes. when you suspend on navigation from executes, right? And so yep. you get to save state or do whatever it is you want to. But what's great is when you're resumed on navigation to. Receives that state back. Does not. No, it doesn't, remember? Yeah. Because. Well, you do. No, because the, no, it absolutely doesn't. Because um, when you do a, uh, wait, let me think about this. It absolutely does. Yes, I know. It absolutely does. <laughs> 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 as well as passing in the previous state. So if you're wondering what to do, you can do it there as well. Well, so, and sorry. basically, you know, to, to talk about these things, you know, we're passing around simple strings and so on. Mm -hmm. They can be persisted in a dictionary that ultimately has been written out to um, local storage. So there is this whole serialization activity that's going on behind the scenes. Now, when Jerry was talking about, you see some demos out there that had to pass around these really rich objects. The challenge with those is if you've got all these custom types, there may not be a serializer that understands how to serialize those elements out as strings so it can write them out to this storage state. Mm -hmm. That is part of the challenge, and which is why really we advocate for storing out just the values that you need to recover state and IDs if you need to go and bring in rich objects. That's right. Keep it simple. You can store all the complicated stuff elsewhere where you can control it because it's a simple serializer that's used yeah. in uh, saving the navigation state. All right, that's the last. I don't see uh, anything looming here. We've done a good job. Uh, let me say this. Um, it's important that you take the poll. My manager called. He said, if I don't get a perfect score, I'm fired. <laughs>
Uh, oh dear, now, you, now you've now you really done it. <laughs> I, know. I mean, what I really want to see is, I want to see more conversations around XAML. I want to see MVA really light up around this framework, and this will just encourage us to really see um, what the interest level is and things like that. So take it seriously. It'll be a lot of fun when we think about other courses we can bring and talk about XAML from other perspectives. Meanwhile, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be talking about even more, going into Solarizer and a lot of the so, different features that we can incorporate into our universal yeah, apps. Yeah, quick run through is security, local data, communication, view services, advanced features, and whatever else we might have squeezed in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, well, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Uh, Jerry and Monkey. <laughs> oh, Thanks very much, everybody. And thank you, Barry. You're welcome. All right.